I am uh, Jay Radcliffe. I'm a senior security analyst for InGuardians. Today we're going to talk about fact and fiction and uh, with medical devices, talking about medical device security, the process of medical device security, and we're going to bust some commonly held myths about security and the FDA and, and how we handle these devices. Before I talk about that though, I want to say a couple words about uh, a fellow researcher that passed away last week in Barnaby Jack. Barnaby and I worked on the same kind of devices. Uh, and I often say that we played in the same playground. Um, and we didn't really see eye to eye on many issues, uh, as a lot of researchers don't. Um, and I'm going to really miss his technical expertise on a lot of those things and uh, kind of the little bit of rivalry that you have with researchers in trying to make things safer, make things better in, in many of those ways. Um, you know, I highly encourage any, everybody to, uh, to kind of go to the kind of memorial in his speaking slot tomorrow and to hear stories about him and to kind of keep him in mind and maybe raise a pint or two in his name uh, as the week progresses. So let's talk about why am I up here? How did I get in this position? This is me when I'm five. Uh, my dad said as soon as I figured out how a screwdriver worked, I took apart everything I could find and not put it back together. Um, so in the past 23 years, uh, I've worked for ISS, uh, then IBM, um, doing a lot of computer security administration experience. Uh, so building architectures to do security hardware, all those types of things. I'm also an FCC licensed amateur radio operator since I was uh, about 12 years old. Um, that gives me a lot of experience with wireless, a lot of building things hands on, um, a lot of intimate experiences with uh, wireless activity and antennas and all sorts of fun stuff. I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice pre-law and I have a master's degree from SANS in information security engineering. As a patient, I was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic on my 22nd birthday. Um, I've been using an insulin pump for a little over 12 years and I've had the pleasure of wearing over seven medical devices in my diabetic career from different insulin pumps, CGMs, uh, that doesn't even count the various glucose meters and other diabetic hardware that I've collected as well. I also gave a small talk two years ago at Black Hat called Breaking the Human SCADA System for Fun and Insulin. In that talk I uh, demonstrated with the Medtronic insulin pump some insecurities with their wireless uh, and I was able to turn the pump off remotely, uh, which some people found fairly interesting. Why do you care about this talk? Well, when I was here before, I had a lot of media people and a lot of people in the field talk about sensationalizing the issue of medical device risk. It's a big point that people bring up to me that, you know, this really isn't realistic. This is never ever going to happen. And I don't really think that's true. You know, as we all know as security practitioners, this can happen when we least expect it and just that's the nature of these types of devices. You go back 15 years and you tell people, well, they're going to break into your web server, people would go, meh, who cares? Um, then we put our entire financial system on that web server and now all of a sudden we do care. So, you know, we want to try and get to that problem before it becomes a major issue. And just because, just because we haven't had any deaths by medical devices, and that hasn't happened yet, and the risk is fairly low of that occurring, it doesn't mean that it cannot happen. You know, I hear this argument all the time, well, from vendors especially, well, that hasn't happened yet. That's not realistic. Well, does that mean we should just ignore it? I don't think that's necessarily the case. We see more and more technology being integrated into health systems and health devices, but we don't see any security being applied to that. And that frightens me as a patient and as somebody who has kids and somebody who has parents, every one of us has somebody that's gone to the hospital or have interaction with a health medical device. These issues need to be the process of looking at security on these devices at several levels that needs to be addressed and that's part of what we're going to be talking about and giving examples about here today. Let's talk about some facts. We're going to talk a little bit about diabetes and give you some, some background and some context to how these devices work uh, to help you kind of process what these threats can do. There are an estimated 3 million type 1 diabetics in the U.S. alone. There are over 80 that are diagnosed every day. 
Those diabetics account for just about $15 billion annually in healthcare costs. This is a very big medical field and a lot of money is there being processed, um, or not being processed, but being spent on diabetic devices and diabetic equipment. There are over half a million insulin pumps that are in use worldwide right now. Some of them as old as 15 years, some of them as new as they came out last week. So there's a huge span of devices uh, that are being used all over the world that could be very vulnerable. There are two types of diabetics. The first is a type 1 diabetic. Type 1 diabetics don't produce any insulin at all. Their pancreas is kaput. Um, this used to be referred to as juvenile diabetes, um, but now we see this coming up in the people in their 20s, and I've even met people in their 40s and 50s who have been diagnosed with type 1. So we don't really call it juvenile diabetes anymore because that is, the disease has grown much further than that. There are also type 2 diabetics. These diabetics have insulin problems. They're either resistive to insulin, they don't have enough production of insulin by their pancreas, or they have other problems with their endocrine system related to insulin. So with the obese, obesity <laughs> epidemic that's occurring right now, that puts a lot of strain on the pancreas, and that's why we're seeing a really large exponential growth in type 2 diabetics um, in the world. What is diabetes? How does it impact a human? Well, to understand these threats, you have to kind of understand how this works. And really, the human body is really like a SCADA system. We take measurements and we make adjustments to correct for those things, just like you would in like a chemical plant or an industrial environment. And because we're security practitioners, it kind of makes sense to look at it in this way. The liver produces sugar and you eat sugar. So those two things provide the fuel and the insulin provides the chemistry that, so you can turn that fuel into something usable. Normally, if you're not diabetic, these two things balance off each other in perfect harmony. Diabetics have just lost one component of it, the pancreas. So ideally, you want to keep your sugars between 80 and 120. That's the ideal range and what most non-diabetics have their blood sugars at. Diabetics have two kind of modes. The first mode we'll talk about is high blood sugar, called hyperglycemia. It means you have too much sugar in your bloodstream and not enough insulin. So let's say I eat a Snickers bar and it has 32 grams of carbohydrates in it, and I totally forget, blow off putting any insulin in my body for it. My sugar is going to go up 200 points in about 45 minutes because that sugar gets into my bloodstream and there's no insulin to do anything to convert that into energy or to convert that into stored energy at all. In the short term, I'm going to have an excessive amount of thirst. The reason I have that thirst is the way the body gets rid of sugar in your bloodstream is through the kidneys. So your body will go, I need a bunch of liquid because I'm going to flush all this out through my kidneys. And that's why you get so thirsty. Blurred vision is another aspect to hyperglycemia. Because of the way the blood sugar and the blood vessels work, it changes the way your eye is shaped and it gives you blurred vision. You also can get headaches. And diabetics have different reactions uh, in many ways to these high blood sugars. You also have energy problems because now you can't use the raw blood sugar in your system. Your body converts to burning fat. And burning fat is a very consuming process for your body. It produces ketones, which can be very dangerous in your body, and it can put a lot of stress on your body organs. Long term, we have kidney damage problems, we have neuropathy, and we have circulatory problems. A lot of diabetics that are way out of control start losing toes, losing fingers. They just kind of start cutting at the ends and they keep moving up as that tissue dies. So it's a very serious problem. On the other side of that coin is low blood sugar, hypoglycemia. A lot of diabetics refer to it as hypoing. So let's say I eat a Snickers bar and I give myself twice as much insulin as I'm supposed to. I make an incorrect calculation. My sugars will start dropping very rapidly. In the short term, as I drop under 70, my body will start shutting down. I will start to shake. I will lose fine motor control. I will start sweating very profusely. 
the body will try and save itself. Just like in hypothermia, it'll turn things off from the outside in, the last being the heart and the brain. It's very similar to being drunk. And people are often mistake people who are hypoing as being very drunk. Hypoglycemia, when untreated, will kill you. Your brain and your heart only run on sugar. And when you run out of sugar, they stop working. There was a 10 year study done that was recently published that showed somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of type 1 diabetics are going to die from hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia related events. This is the most serious and quickly serious condition a diabetic gets into. And every diabetic is scared of low blood sugar because they know the consequences of not correcting that condition will put them in a coma and possibly kill them. I said that low blood sugar kind of gets mistaken for being drunk and the brain starts shutting down and it's a very scary thing. This gentleman up here, his name is Alan and he, is, he runs one of the diabetic camps that I volunteer for in Idaho. He is an ER physician, has had type 1 diabetes for a very long time, over 25 years. Um, and I'm going to show you a little video of him right now when his blood sugar was under 40 um, to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like when a diabetic has a low blood sugar or hypo event. I'm not sure if the sound. <laughs> Let me see if we can do this here. And the drop package. Eat your tabs. I ate my tabs. What do you want me to do now? Eat some more tabs, Alan. No. I'm yeah. putting my pants on. Oh, I missed. <laughs> Alan, you stay seated. You're not uh -uh. putting pants on. Can I have your pants? No. <laughs> well, I need some pants. See, look, they're not on me. Alan. So that, that's Alan. And Alan for religious reasons doesn't drink um, and a lot of diabetics choose not to drink uh, because of the chemistry issues involved with it and because they can confuse it for low blood sugar which is kind of dangerous. So how is the interaction between these medical devices that diabetics wear and the FDA? The FDA has the regulatory authority over medical devices in the United States. All medical devices go through this approval process by the FDA. This process is primarily for medical safety, right? So they look at the device and say, is this medicinally safe? They look at the medicine, they look at the way it gets delivered. It's very focused on that element. That is the area that they are given power over. Now recently, last month, they came forward and said that there's going to be more sc scrutiny on the security aspects of these devices. The other thing that you need to know about the FDA is their resources are fairly limited. They're nowhere close to being a full pen test of a device. The vendor provides documentation for review and there's a very limited back and forth between the FDA and the medical device vendor over what kind of security controls are implemented on these devices. And before, Jan before last month, cybersecurity concerns and security concerns with the device were not a reason to reject the device. So if they found problems with the device but it was medicinally safe, they approved it anyway. The other thing that's very important to know is that after the FDA approves the device, they have very, very little power to regulate those devices. So once it gets out the door and it's in the market, the FDA has very limited legal authority to say, for example, you must patch your device you must update your device so it encrypts the communication stream. They can't do that. These medical devices are used by diabetics very heavily. They control hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. For the past two years, these devices in the community or the hardware community has been researching these devices because there's so many of them and they're kind of prevalent outside of the hospital. 
You know, Barnaby has looked at them, I've looked at them, Kevin Fu has looked at them. There are a lot of researchers out there looking at this particular class of device. After my talk two years ago, two congressional, uh, a, a representative, uh, a House of Representative member and a senator asked the GAO to do a report looking into who's responsible for the security mechanisms on these devices when they're approved. The report was published in September of last year and it showed that nobody's looking at it. No regulatory agency is responsible for the security aspects of these devices. The vendor's responsible for it. The FDA looks at the medicinal side, the FCC looks at the transmitter and the technical side but not the content of those transmissions. So it's kind of a big problem. The GAO report suggested that there should be a change in this, that somebody should look at it, but they stopped short of making any specific recommendations or specific actions that should be taken. The FDA made a statement that cybersecurity issues are going to be part of device review starting, in, starting right now, starting in June. So these devices, as they go through the process now, are going to be, have, they're going to be looked at with the concept of computer security in mind and they can be rejected on that, which is something that the GAO report recommended, not recommended that they do, but is in line with what the GAO talked about. But what exactly defines a medical device? You know, we in the community throw that term around quite a bit. So I've kind of broken it down into three categories. The first category is an independent medical device. These are devices that stand alone and have embedded processors and code in them. Now, some of the examples would be an insulin pump, a pacemaker, an ICD, things that get embedded into our bodies. Right? And these devices have unique issues. They have very limited power. I mean, you can't go change the AA battery in your pacemaker when it's embedded in your chest. They have very limited access. They haven't gotten to the point where they put a USB port on me yet uh, to plug me in and do firmware updates, which is probably good or not. Uh, and they also have the unique aspect of being directly connected to a human. You know, we look at a lot of systems all the time. We look at bank, we look at financial systems, but this is getting into some scary territory because they're connected to you physically and they change you physically. The next class of device I refer to as a peripheral medical device. Now these are devices that need to connect to another computer or are based on a traditional computer system. An example might be an MRI machine, a CT scanner, an X-ray machine. These devices plug into a traditional computer and run applications on a traditional operating system, be it Windows, be it Linux, those types of things, things that we're very familiar with. These ha also have unique issues. Vendors are not in 100% in control of these systems. So these systems, you know, they run on Windows. Well, the vendor doesn't have the ability to patch Windows libraries. Only Microsoft does. So they're not in total control of these devices. Also, the lifespan of the medical device might be longer than the computer. So when you go into your hospital and see that they're running Windows ME on their x-ray machine, they bought that device and that was the supported operating system and now they can't, they might not be able to upgrade that device to a modern operating system. And then what we have these hybrid devices that I refer to as networked medical devices. And these are ones that utilize wireless and utilize networks for connectivity. So an example of my, that might be an infusion pump, a CGM, heart rate sensors. These are wireless sensors that can take in biomedical data and then use them somewhere else. Um, for example, your iPhone, like on the picture here. These have the unique issue of having a ton of wireless options. You got Bluetooth, you got 802.11, RFID, you also have all of the possible proprietary RF that you could ever think of. Oh, lots of things could go wrong, right? It's a very large attack surface because they just randomly put whatever they want on there. This is also a super hot area, right? They want medical devices to snap space and tweet, Vine, Facebook, everything. Okay? We want our devices connected to us. Uh, and they want it connected to our life in general. I mean, the current generation, you know, that's out there thinks that everything should connect to their iPhone. And maybe they don't want their medical devices connected to their iPhone. But they certainly ask for it all the time. So consumers are going to drive what the market does. 
The FDA has two prevalent systems that you need to know about. The first is EMDR, Electronic Medical Device Reporting. This is a voluntary system to report medical device problems. And in the community, we talk about that quite a bit. Hey, we report things to the FDA, and we see these reports. They get put into a database, and the vendor's notified, and we have all those things. This database is called MOD. Uh, you know, I always think of my grandmother when I think of MOD. Um, but it's the manufacturer and user device experience. And there's been a lot of talks about medical devices using MOD. And, you know, we, we can see software bugs in MOD. And we can see medical device problems in MOD. So, but really it's just a database of adverse experiences, right? I looked up my insulin pump, which is an Animus ping, and I found thousands of entries in MOD for it. Now for the purposes of InfoSec and device security, almost 100% of them are total junk. They are completely irrelevant and useless. I'll give you an example. This person, where the patient outcome was listed as life-threatening, dropped his insulin pump in the toilet. And he was very concerned and felt that he had high blood sugar because he dropped his insulin pump in the toilet. So he submitted an EMDR record and that got put into MOD and the vendor looked at the insulin pump and established that it was working perfectly fine. There are thousands of these records in MOD of users doing crazy crap like, and blaming it on their pump. And every time the vendor's got to respond to it. So let's talk about how this might work in the computer security field or a computer bug world. So I had an adverse experience. I had a severe hypoglycemic event in March. I had sub 50 sugars about 1 a.m. and I didn't need to go to the hospital. I probably could have gone to the hospital, but I was able to correct for it at home and get myself restabilized and all that. So that was very fortunate. But the next day, I was like, you know, something didn't sit right. Like, it, I don't typically hypo that hard. Um, and it, something just bugged me about it. So I went back and I pulled my history and I looked at the history and I found that I over bolused by eight units. And this is a very substantial amount of insulin. This is a lot of insulin. And I was like, that's crazy. How, how in the world did this happen? I was shocked. So I went over the history and I'm looking at all the things I did and I'm thinking about it and I'm like, you know, I did change the battery. Could that have anything? No, that couldn't have anything to do with it. I mean, changing the battery, I, that can't be a part of it. So let's do a little demo here. This is rather dangerous for a diabetic to do. I don't recommend you do it. I am a professional diabetic. I consult with experts. So we're going to put on this camera here. Let's see. Can you guys see that? Is it upside down? Awesome, it corrects for me. This is my insulin pump. I've had it for a little over, it'll be about two years next month. So the insulin pump remembers exactly how much medicine I have in my body. That's its job. It's its major role in life, really. And you can look at that uh, through the status screen. It'll say IOB. That top line there that says IOB, I have 5.5 units of insulin in my body right now. And to kind of give you a short little example, I took my blood sugar right before this talk. So if I say, go into the wizard, and let's say blood sugar, and my blood sugar is very high right now, which is bad, but it's needed for the demo. My blood sugar was 342. And it should be 110. So it knows, and it does the calculations and it yells at me. All right, that's what I want to do. It does the math and see it, to correct for that, I would take eight units. But I have five units in my body still. So it would like to give me two units of insulin. That makes sense. So let's change the battery. The battery change is pretty simple. This nice attack weapon that is a coin. So the screen went off. Let's put it back together. Oh, it beeps. 
Okay. All right. Verify the time. Yep. It's still the time that it was two seconds ago. Go to the menu. Go to this. Blood glucose. Yeah, yeah. Hold on a second here. Okay. This will be a little easier here. Okay. On this screen, it says that I have no insulin in my body. So now when I go and run that calculation, instead of having five units, in, five and a half units in my body, I have zero. So if I were to correct my sugar right now and follow the directions that the pump explicitly tells me to do, I'm going to give myself five and a half units too much. And that is going to put me at about negative 50, uh, negative 25 in blood sugar, which would pretty much mean I'm dead if I didn't correct. What this looks like when I submitted the bug report is this. The IOB shows 6.05 6 units and it wanted to give me five units to correct, very similar to the correction I showed you. After the battery change, 10 seconds later, it wants to give me the full 11 units. What this tells me is that they're not keeping that information in non-volatile memory. So when you change the battery, it just forgets it. I tested this on every brand of insulin pump I could get my hands on. I have over five of them actually and no other insulin pump acts like this. I was really floored by it. I thought, wow, this was something crazy that they overlooked. To give you an idea, like I said, six units too much for me is the difference between having perfect blood sugar and having negative 50 blood sugar, which is, you know, bad. So the FDA involvement in this reporting, okay? I went to the FDA with this and I said, hey guys, is this a cybersecurity issue? Like I don't know where I'm supposed to do with this. And the FDA was like, uh-huh, it's definitely a computer-based problem and it's very medically dangerous and that's what we're talking about when we talk about cybersecurity, computers being dangerous. And I chuckled, cyber, haha, uh -huh, you know, cyber can mean anything computer now apparently. So I'm like, okay. They're like, submit it through the EMDR. So I went through the EMDR and it was functional. It was clunky as most government systems are, but I got my security concerns to them. The FDA then vetted that submission, made sure that I wasn't just dumping it in the toilet or something crazy like that. Then the vendor got notified and the vendor has 45 days to contact me. And I had a very nice nurse call me very early on a Sunday morning to make sure that I was okay 45 days after I submitted the report. <laughs> so I talked to the RN and she was like, you know, we say that in the manual. And I was like, what? So I pull out the 400 page manual and sure enough on page 72 there's one sentence that says, when you change the, when you change the battery, it will forget all this stuff. Oh, really? Okay. Well, okay. So you almost killed me and actually I looked through my history and it happened twice in the last six months, which is as far back as the insulin pump history goes. So I was like, okay. So I asked the RN, what, what are you going to do about it? And she was like, what do you mean what are you going to do about it? I said, well, this is a problem. Like, you're going to fix this? She was like, well, that's out of my, that's, that's above my pay grade. So we escalated it to the PR people and the engineering staff. Ah, so initially they were very friendly. Jay, this is great work you do. I'm so glad you submitted it to the FDA. You're a great customer. <laughs> let's, get a let's get a call. We'll get our medical officer and our R&D team on here and we'll, we'll, have a we'll have a talk about it. I'm thinking, wow, this is really great. This is like perfect scenario. Like all sunshine and rainbows. Not so much. So during the call, the first thing they said was, Mr. Radcliffe, the first thing we'd like to ask you is to stop calling it a bug and stop calling it a design flaw because this is totally intentional. So don't call it that. It's a little insulting. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a great way to start off a nice friendly talk. They insisted that this is the way the pump was designed. It is the safest way they could do things, that they, make don't, they don't make mistakes and that it was my fault. Okay. That's very nice. And then they were like, by the way, we put it in the manual. Read the manual. And by the way, read the manual. We put it in the manual. 
Thanks. I clearly am a dumb user. I have no experience with computers whatsoever. So I can't operate your pump. Then they were like, we aren't going to fix this. It's not a problem. We really don't see it as an issue. But we take your input seriously. Like all of our customers' concerns, we will look at it in the next generation of products. They were really aggressive about being, this is the safest design. They were like, this is a safety feature. It's not a bug, it's a feature. <sighs> but when pressed, I said, what scenario is that designed for? And they were like, you know, diabetic scenarios. <laughs> I know, I know about these diabetic scenarios. I just demonstrated how you can replicate this and that how it could kill me. And you're okay with that? And they're like, we put it in the manual. Duh, it's totally fine. If you document it, then it's not a problem. Oh, then they were like, oh, yeah, even if we wanted to fix it, yeah, we got to go through all this regulation and that could take who knows how long, you know, because it's got to go through the fuel review cycle again. And I was like, all right, here we go. First myth, device updates. The vendor says, patching and updating is difficult due to the FDA review process. Every medical device vendor that ever has existed has said this at one point in time. The reality is that the FDA regulations state they can only review the device if the changes to functionality have changed substantially. So if you take my insulin pump and you want to turn it into a neural stimulator, it's got to go through the review process. Other than that, you can do whatever you want. The FDA has absolutely no regulatory power to review device updates. If a company wants to do a device update, they're free to do it. Vendors should be patching when confronted with bugs, vulnerabilities, and flaws in their devices. They should have the ability to do this. They should be actively doing this when they see these types of problems. The FDA also came out and said the need to be vigilant and responsive to cybersecurity vulnerabilities is part of your obligation under the law to systematically analyze these sources and to implement actions to correct and prevent those problems. It's the responsibility of the vendor to do this by law. <laughs> that is very true. So let's talk about an example of this. Let's talk about a hero. Abbott released a new glucose meter by the name of Insulex. Very fancy meter, touch screen, I own one, very nice device. There was a flaw discovered. When you had a blood sugar over 1024, it would record it into the database incorrectly. Basically at 1024 it would flip. So if you had a 1068 blood sugar, it would record it as 44, right? This is pretty common. They forgot to class that particular variable for that and it just rolled over. After it was reported a month later in April 2013, they conducted a voluntary recall where you went and downloaded a firmware update. You plugged it in with the USB cable and boop, firmware updated, took you all of two minutes. I actually performed it on my meter. It was very smooth. It worked very, very well. It was done in conjunction with the FDA. They put it on their website. They made it very clear how to do it. They sent letters to all their users that were registered. It worked perfectly. Easy, it was simple, it was efficient. They're good guys. Good job, Abbott. Very good. This is exactly how I expect things to work. We expect medical devices, okay, you found a problem, cool, we'll do our patching, we'll do our due diligence, we'll test everything, we'll do our regression, just like any other product that you would put out. And then you put out a patch for it and then let the users apply it. They own the device. They have the device at hand. Worst case scenario, you have to go to your doctor's office to apply the update. Okay. That's acceptable too. Let's talk about another similar myth. Operating system updates. Medical device vendor goes, hey, you can't apply patches to that box. That box is a medical device. If you patch that medical device, we won't support it anymore. The vendor often doesn't test patches for the impact of medical functionality. 
So you set up your system at that time, that's how they tested that system, it's got to stay like that. You can't make those changes because if you change this library, the argument is what if the device stops working the way it's supposed to and cooks your patient like an MRI machine? The vendor often blames the regulators for making this process difficult because we can't change the medical device because if you apply, if you apply that patch MS 08067, then you have to go through the review process again and that takes five years, for example. The FDA statement on this in their guidance documents is that you, the device manufacturer who uses off the shelf software in your medical device, bear the responsibility for co the continued safe and effective performance of the medical device, including the performance of the, the off the shelf software that is part of the device. The vendor is responsible for those patches, for making sure that their device works with those patches by law, says the FDA. And the FDA came out in 2009 and says, then they say, we want to remind you that cybersecurity for medical devices and their associated networks is a shared responsibility between the manufacturers and the user facilities like hospitals. Update your operating systems and medical device software. Software updates offer the latest protections against harmful activities. Huh? So first they say it is totally the responsibility of the vendor to make sure that works. Then they say, actually, it's the responsibility of both the owner of the device and the manufacturer of the device to make sure they're patched. These guidance documents often refer to a document in 1999 where they say, about, written in 99 about, doesn't say anything about patching, it says that you, don't, you can't make changes to the device. In 1999, how often did patches come out? Did we have Microsoft Tuesday back then? No. How much malware was there around back then? How many problems did we have back then? Those guidance documents caused problems and quite a bit of confusion amongst these three documents, the 1999 guidance document, the 2005 one, and the 2009 one. So this is kind of a little bit of a quandary that the FDA has put us, put the medical device community in. How do we address these operating system patches? Ideally, let's take a look at a scenario. Acme makes an MRI machine and it uses Windows 2003 as its operating system. As we know, every month there's a security patch released by Microsoft products. So MS 08067 is released and Acme says they do not support patching on the machine. Only the configuration that's installed is supported. So the hospital is in a crappy position here. So if they patch the machine, then Acme is not going to support them anymore and the machine could medically malfunction, which is a pretty substantial problem. You don't want to hurt your patients. But if you don't patch the machine, then you risk all sorts of external threats and all sorts of problems that would affect the machine's integrity, which would also cause medical malfunction, hurting the patient. So as a hospital, you're in a bind here. It's a very difficult position to be in. Now here in an ideal world, Acme would review and test these patches when they're released by the operating system vendor within 30 days of its release. It would send guidance to all the device owners when they can patch their device and if there are any workarounds that they need to deal with with that device. Acme is re responsible for the continued safe and effective performance of the device, including the operating system. We do not live in this world. We don't live in anywhere close to this world right now. So if you're waiting for the FDA to make medical devices safe, you're going to be waiting a long time. I love the FDA. The FDA is very good at what they do. They're very good with vulnerability disclosure. Their process needs some work, but I was rather pleased with the process overall. They notified the vendor, they got the ball rolling, they had the right contacts, the company responded very well, it worked out very good. But the FDA's powers are very limited. Congress controls what they have power over. They can't just do whatever they want. Cybersecurity wasn't even around when they were granted their powers by the FDA and the latest extension of those powers were in 1976. Post device approval, the FDA's ability to mandate actions like recalls in relation to medical devices is virtually non-existent. If you have a software bug that's a problem in a medical device, 
The FDA can write it down and they can make recommendations, but they have no power. They do not have the ability to force manufacturers to do anything. Guidance and recommendation is the best they can offer. <coughs> so what are we going to do about it? Let's have a couple calls for action here. First thing we need to do is look at these FDA guidance documents. The problem is the FDA guidance memos from 99, 2005, and 2013 are somewhat in conflict. It doesn't clearly outline who's responsible for updates, patches. And what documentation do we need to provide for those device updates? My recommendation is to require a 501K or a PMN, those are the two ways you can get a medical device approved, to have a supplement for software updates. I went looking through the, these are all publicly available through the FDA's websites. And there are some manufacturers when they update their software, they have a little note that it's attached to it. It's just a supplement that says, hey, we updated this and it doesn't even have to have a super awesome description. We updated this because we found some bugs and we fixed them. Right? Medtronic is actually very good at doing this. They have submitted, they, when I looked and did a search for them, there were almost a hundred of these types of issues that they submitted where they just added the supplement and said we did a, we did a software update for this application. These are required so that way if the FDA ever audits you, they know what the history of that software is. I say that those should be required and that the guidance documents should be clearly outlined about how they need to address those. The next thing I think that we really need to do is to help, well the problem is is that risk evaluation of patches doesn't occur, right? Let's say you own the Acme MRI scanner and Microsoft 2003 is running on that device and there's 15 patches that have patched these DLLs. You don't know which ones are important or which ones aren't. My recommendation is to classify the libraries to help vendors and operators evaluate patch risk. So a class A library would be a library that's directly provided by the vendor and supported only by the vendor. A class B library is provided by the operating system, supported by the operating system, but is directly used by the medical device application. So if you know these 15 DLLs are being used actively by your device, you would list them. Class C libraries are provided by the operating system, supported by the operating system, and are not directly used by the medical device. So that way, when you see these medical devices, you see which DLLs they're using, when you look at the patch list, you can quickly determine, you know what, none of these libraries are used by this system, so I have the risk determination that it is a low risk to patch this device and I can do that. Whereas if you have a high risk one where you have a library that is patched and is critical but the operating, the medical device application uses it, then you can go to the vendor and say, hey, we need to test this. I know that there's a higher risk of me breaking the box and breaking the application because of this patch. That would give a lot of people the ability to make good risk calculations on if they should patch or if they should not patch. The buyers of these devices, hospitals, the VA, places like that, they're kind of complacent, right? Most patients and most operators of these devices believe there's not much they can do about the problems that they see, right? We know that they exist, their IT departments know they exist, but what are they going to do about it, right? Usually these purchases are made by the doctor. A doctor with a lot of power goes in and is like, I want Acme brand pacemakers. That is what I want. That's what I've been trained on. Th I believe those are the best medically. And the hospital goes, okay, we take your word on it. Let's sign the check for $2 million. Give us the pacemakers. And then your IT department's like, where do these come from? Is everything's written in Visual Basic and runs, win runs Windows ME. Who, b who bought these? And then the doctor doesn't care. Essentially has immunity in that process. My suggestion is make security part of the buying criteria. In that, you have to look at the lifespan of the device compared to the lifespan of the operating system, right? That device is going to be there for 15 years. You better start asking questions about what happens when Windows ME goes out of support. Is the medical device vendor prepared to upgrade to Windows 98 or Windows 7 or whatever their plan of action is for the next operating system or are they just going to ditch it on you? 
You got to ask hard questions about patches, about updates, about third party security. Hey, we run Acme brand antivirus software. Is that okay with you guys? Could we, is that a problem? Because we're not going to buy it if we can't do that. How do you do patches? How do you handle patches? Can this device be updated? Because that would be a good, that would be a good thing to know if you can update your device or not. Involve IT groups or outside consultants in the purchasing process, right? Get your IT department in there. So that way they can look at the device and go, okay, we can tolerate that. And they'll know what kind of questions to ask. Like how to get it on the network. Does it support WPA? Can we do a firmware update? Things like that. They're going to ask those questions and you need to pay attention to the answers. Because ultimately it's going to cost you money if it doesn't. Also contact the vendor. Submit EMDRs when you have problems. Right? Use the process that's there. It does do its job. It is not perfect, but it is something that we have and it is something that we can leverage to make things better. A couple final thoughts. I saw a patent application when I was doing my research for this. A portable medical device, which is preferably a wearable insulin pump, is provided with a web server and is controlled over a network by a browser equipped client. Okay, we hardly trust web servers with something as meaningless as a credit card number. You want me to put that on me to control my medicine and then you want me to go with a web client? No. Uh uh. That's where these devices are going. That's what these devices are going to become. They're going to piggyback onto your cell phone with Bluetooth and they're going to phone home and they're going to give your data to the cloud. And it scares the crap out of me. It scares the crap out of me as a patient. It scares the crap out of me as a security person. It scares the crap out of me as a parent. That's where these devices are going. We need to get ahead of this, not fall behind it. We have to make sure that people are looking at these security problems, looking at these things, and making sure they're safe to be able to put onto your children, onto your parents, onto yourself. With that, I'll ask you to please do the evaluation thing, however the gizmo works. And if you have any questions, you have any comments, please feel free to hit me up at this email address or any time this week I'll be around specifically at the Hardware Hacking Village at DEF CON or just around here in general. Don't hesitate to comment or contact me if you have any questions or anything like that. With that, thank you very much. I appreciate your time.